Yo, what it do YouTube and welcome back to another video. Today, we are going to be looking into FNAF Help Wanted. Now, in the last video, I asked if you guys thought I should play this. The majority said yes. I'm, I'm going to say it again right here. Drop it in the comments. Should I play Help Wanted on the channel? And let's hop right into this video. Back to VR. Okay, Playing through the go. game, it is legitimately impressive. Pretty much everyone here is recreated in a stunning 3D environment. That Bonnie, is actually... Baby, Funtime okay. Freddy the Puppet. Heck, even Easter egg appearances by Mini Renas and Lolbit. Characters oh. that most of you watching this probably haven't even heard of before because you have uh -huh. much better things to do with your brain space than I do. Practically everyone is here in this game, except for one important omission. Golden Freddy. I mean, Ballora isn't around either, but you know, I said important. Ba -ba -ba! But that seems weird, okay. right? I mean, this is a game that drops you into perfect recreations of the first three installments of the series. You don't just forget about one of the most important characters to the lore of these games. Well, that's because it isn't some careless oversight. Golden Freddy isn't here for a reason. It's our first clue that this game isn't just a joke and mm. is a canonical entry. Specifically, it tells us where it falls in line with everything else that we've played through. Golden Freddy isn't here because she's busy hanging out in H-E double chica arms with William Afton. Think back to the oh. end of Ultimate Custom Night and our previous theories. By tracking the voice lines used throughout the game, Okay, hold on. I am the fearful reflection of what you have created. The marionette. Okay. This is FNAF 4, Freddy. What a gift to relish a victim that can't perish. Ooh, that's deep. Okay, and then this is Nightmare Fredbear. Or, I, I, I don't know if that's just Fredbear. I don't know, man. I, I think, bro, but I might be wrong. We know who our friends are, and you are not one of them. Game over screens, we okay. were able to piece together that we're playing as William Afton in that game. Child okay. killer extraordinaire. And that the whole game was him trapped in hack to atone for his sins. And the thing oh, that was keeping him there was the night? one he should not have killed, a girl named Cassidy. The Every spirit who had an axe to grind, evil. possessing the Golden Freddy suit. Every picture of her is just evil, bro. No matter what, it's always... the. I know it's the stock picture, but still... The reason Golden Freddy isn't in FNAF VR is because the spirit is down there tormenting Willie A forever, from here until the end of the series. That's why the ultimate ending of Custom Night was Golden Freddy twitching off into the darkness. Cassidy never gives up her soul, no matter what Old Man Consequences okay. said. Further cementing that Help Wanted is now at the end of the FNAF timeline is this miserable- Whoa, 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 time out, go right back real quick. The FNAF time- Okay, okay, okay. That is a weird timeline. The way they, they started it. Okay, so. This is saying, I don't know if it's starting from the bottom or the top, but from the bottom it's saying FNAF Help Wanted, then Custom Night, Pizzeria Simulator, Sister Location, FNAF World, FNAF 3, FNAF 1, the original, then 2, then 4. I don't know what that order stands for. Timeline is this miserable little creature right here, the Scrap Baby Plush. Because why wouldn't okay. you want to cuddle with something that rips in half and eats children alive? Let me remind everyone who doesn't have an encyclopedic index of all 60 plus animatronics that have graced the screen in this franchise, that Scrap Baby is the homeless hobo version Ew. of the old baby after escaping sister location and who was voted out of the Ennard tribe sometime between FNAF 5 and 6. Her only on-screen appearance is in FNAF 6, so the fact that a reference to her exists in this game at all means that it must come Dang. after her expulsion from Ennard, sometime definitely after FNAF 5, but again, with Golden Freddy missing, it seems to secure it after everything's burned down and closed. So we have ourselves a company that's trying to rebuild its reputation after a series of tragic events. Seems pretty simple, right? <laughs> of course not. This is a FNAF game. You know that the story is never going to be that obvious. Hidden throughout the game are cassette tapes that, when collected, unleash a new monster into the right. hallways of this pizzeria with the game's files refer to okay. as glitch trap a yellow bunny with purple eyes hmm yellow bunny with purple eyes you say i think i yeah. might know where this is headed as you collect more and more tapes this glitch rabbit comes closer and closer becoming this is in game like so if i play he's actually just gonna start walking up on me like what's good bro more and more fully formed. B 
beat all the mini games and you unlock the final challenge, Pizza Party. A nightmarish fever dream that mashes together every location that you just played through. Waiting for you at the end of this horrific maze is the single scariest moment from the entire franchise. And I can't emphasize that enough. It is literally chilling. What you learn is that you, a seven-year-old, have been lured to the back room of Freddy's. And what awaits you is your pizza party, complete with Dang. your favorite flavor of cake, all your best animatronic friends, and then Glitch Trap calls you to follow him. The music fades, and suddenly you're on stage. You're holding Freddy's microphone. You are Freddy. You've been stuffed. You are now a missing child, watching wow. as your killer dances gleefully to the song that you're being forced to stand up on stage and sing. This isn't just a spoopy jump scare of some goofy character. This is real horror. So it definitely seems like this new character, Pedo Hair, over here is William Afton. I mean, sure, the suit yeah. isn't as bulky as a Springlock suit, but he's got all the other qualifications down. Yellow bunny fursona, check. Association with the color purple, check. Yeah. Enjoys children pizza parties just a wee bit too much? Big old check again. Yeah. Then again, to call this character William would be missing a huge chunk of this game's story. This isn't William. Like I said, he's trapped in eternal torment with Cassidy listening to Barney the Hippo over here tell his life story. Dry bread was always fresh on Tuesday. They made sourdough bread on Monday okay. and threw it out Wednesday. Okay. So, Glitch Trap is really just William Afton's soul. It is is basically what I'm getting. So it's not him physically, but it's his embodiment from his soul. Or I, I don't I don't understand, bro. What was I saying? No, to understand who, or better put, what this thing actually is, we need to examine the tapes that summon Glitch Trap here in the first place. Scattered throughout the various minigames are 16 glitching cassettes left okay. behind by a former game dev, Tape Girl, which, when put together, tell the story of a failing game company, a bit of malicious code, and some very mm. stabby, stabby office supplies. We're also introduced to the story of another beta tester, who was in our position before us, named Jerry. Jeremy, making this the third time that the name Jeremy has appeared in these games, with the first being FNAF 2's Night Guard, and then again on the gravestones in FNAF 6. Okay. Coincidence? I think not. The first tape immediately makes it clear we're not picking these up in chronological order. There are more. They may not be in order. Which leaves us the task of shuffling them into some modicum of sense in order to put the story together of what really happened while this game, the game we're supposedly playing now in its final form, was in development. Going through the tapes, I've done the shuffling for you and I think I've come up with the most cohesive narrative based on the evidence and what Tape Girl actually says. She begins by telling okay. us that the game's then playtester Jeremy has been complaining to his manager Dale about nightmares. Except he's not explaining them like they're nightmares, he's talking about them like they're real. He wasn't talking about it like someone telling a friend about his dreams, though. He was pale. He doesn't even jump anymore. He just stands there like he's talking to someone. Pale? Doesn't react to scares? Talking to themselves? Sounds to me like he's going crazy. Either that or he's just a FNAF YouTuber. Hashtag relatable, am I right? The game he's working on is this one, Freddy Fazbear's Virtual Experience, which includes okay. some code that was inherited from Fazbear Entertainment. Scanned off some old hard drives to save him time and money. It was right. just junk. Circuit boards and things like that. It seemed to take hold by itself, but then he started appearing. At least oh. that's what Jeremy said. Manager Dale okay. doesn't seem to take Jeremy's warning seriously, however, and instead he starts documenting all of Jeremy's behavior in preparation to fire him. You can always tell when a company is getting ready to fire someone. The thing about it is that I don't think they were going to fire him because of anything he was doing wrong. They just knew he'd seen something. This confirms for us one major detail. Mm. Might have seen something that they knew was there, bro. Think about it. That the scariest thing in the FNAF universe is crunch time. Working long hours until you're driven crazy and then fired at the end? Man, it's just like the real life games industry. It's uncanny. These Dang. games just get more and more realistic. So Jeremy is going crazy and no one is listening. Flash forward to tape six where Tape Girl talks about coming in early one morning to see the supply okay. room lit and Jeremy in the darkened testing room. It's oh. a short tape, but it's an important one because it sets us up for tape number nine when we learn that what she saw looked like a Halloween mask laying on the ground and a bunch of ink both on Jeremy and scattered around the floor. But that's, that's not, not ink. ink. That's no map. 
Hey, I mean, he said it, not me. The ink is Jeremy's blood, and yeah. the mask it's is actually face. Jeremy's face, which he presumably sliced off his own body using the aptly named guillotine paper cutter. We know this to be true thanks to tape number four, where we hear tape girl say that the cutter comes from the supply room and that Jeremy expressly knew where it was. I didn't even know we had one in the supply room. I was always afraid of losing a finger. That seems so silly now. Jeremy used to do design work. I guess that's how he knew it was there. And for as extreme oh. as this sounds, we know that he sliced off his face due to all these seemingly minute details about how his face was obscured that morning. I went back and peered in the window. I couldn't see his face. He had the visor covering his head. Anyone else getting some bizarre Bite of 87 vibes from this story? Yep. No? Is it just me? Yep. Huh. So Jeremy eventually dies Definitely. from his injuries. After Jeremy's <clears throat> death, things start getting even weirder, which oh. is a relative statement okay. considering that this is the FNAF franchise we're talking about. Tape Girl overhears a conversation about a lawsuit in the aftermath of Jeremy's death, which makes perfect sense given that he died a horrific death on the job. Yeah. In response, the company starts taking some serious steps to cover their tracks, namely to sell off the game and destroy evidence that could incriminate them. In the meantime, Tape Girl takes over Jeremy. Wait, so they destroyed evidence. So, bro, they knew something was up then. They had to have, because why would, okay. Jeremy's I'm a, I'm a role as playtester, and all we can hope is that she really cleaned that VR headset before she put that thing back on. She has three days to playtest the game. Across her audio logs, we learn that in that time, she sees Glitch Trap for the first time and comes to learn... Oh, so whenever they put on, like, the headset or enter the virtual experience that's how he gets control over them okay i'm starting to understand that but i do like so the company like would they not have known something was going on or because they just seem to be very well informed of, of what's happening if they're just trying to you know like clean up real quick but that maybe maybe it's just to her audio log she tries to delete them, but can't. So instead of deleting them, she fragments and disperses them into the 16 small pieces we've been collecting throughout uh. our playthrough, warning us that they shouldn't be reunited at any cost. Hide right. all traces of these logs that I've created. I fear that finding them and reassembling them will also reassemble the very thing I've tried so desperately to destroy. Whoops! Right. Probably shouldn't have hidden that info on tape 15 of 16. After that, though, she seems to backtrack on her story, saying that, in fact, the entity in the game can be killed, and that, to do so, we should reassemble the tapes. Odd, but uh. okay, we've got them all anyway, so might as well see what we can do. Glitch Trap attacks us once we have 16 tapes, and if we don't respond in time, we trade places with him. For a brief second, we see through his eyes back down at the console that we were just operating. Our consciousness has truly melded with his, just like the voiceover warned about at the top of the game. Fazbear Entertainment is not responsible for accidental digital consciousness transference. So, that's a bad ending. But if we okay. do manage to properly follow Tape Girl's instructions as he's trying to mind meld with us, well, he still seems like he escapes. Or at the very least, he definitely doesn't die. This should have been yeah. like some Mr. Smith in the Matrix moment where all his code disintegrates or something. But instead, we're trapped on one side of a door in the game. A bloody, hand-printed door with scratch marks clearly oh. showing people stuck in here desperately trying to escape. So and we, we see Glitch Trap practically skipping off into the darkness. This doesn't seem like the ending we should be getting for putting all the pieces of the tape together and following all the tape maker's instructions. That would be basically mean that FNAF VR has three losing scenarios here. Getting stuffed yeah. at the end of the pizza party, transferring consciousness on the home screen, and getting locked behind the door if you choose. So there's no good ending if I play this, bro? Like, what? What? Is to follow tape Secret girl's ending, instructions. maybe? Secret that ending? That can't be right. Can it? Well, maybe it is. Maybe that's the point of the game. Maybe we are destined to lose no matter what we do here. Oh. I mean, think about it. The canon ending of Sister Location right. was a bad ending, with yeah. Michael getting scooped. Yeah, the canon ending of FNAF 4 was a bad ending, with the crying child getting bitten. In FNAF oh. 6, you and literally everyone else burned to death. I mean, yeah. it's considered a victory, but you're still dead. Now, let's look closer at the text of the audio logs. There is something clearly wrong 
in them. The tapes mm -hmm. start out just fine. They follow her story in a pretty logical way, and we know she's a real person in the real world because she's observing things from outside the game's testing room. Things like mm -hmm. Jeremy complaining to management and the stuff that's present in the supply room. But then, upon closer inspection, you start noticing some strange anomalies. For instance, we have two tapes that both start with her introducing who she is. A okay. hi or a hello followed by, you don't know me or can you hear me? Which is our right. first hint that something's a bit off. The same person is making these tapes the whole time for the same audience. So why introduce herself to us twice so, in both tapes? So in 15, it was already too late and she got controlled, basically. Tape 1 and tape 15. Why would one end with her saying, Now I fear that those logs are being used as a Trojan horse. If you're unable to abandon development, hide all traces of these logs that I've created. Basically telling us to hide the logs, but then also say this. There are more. They may not be in order. Basically inviting us to put them all together. Weirder still is the fact that the last file suddenly does this major about face relative to all the previous logs, where suddenly she says out of nowhere, oh yeah, there is a way to kill Glitch Trap. This is odd on a lot of different levels. The first and most obvious being, if these instructions really do work and she's so sure about it, why didn't she follow them? If this method was yeah. actually effective and she knew it was effective, Glitch Trap wouldn't be in the game anymore because she would have followed her own advice and wiped him out. How right. would she even know that this system works? The answer is it clearly doesn't. Or at least it doesn't do what she says it's gonna do. That's because she's not trying to get you to kill off the entity in the code. She's trying to get you to release it. While we don't yeah. have every piece of the puzzle in this story, here's what I think actually happened with all these audio tapes. The tape maker starts out genuinely making these logs to document the weird stuff that's happening in the game studio. The stuff right. with Jeremy really happens. She really sees Glitch Trap in the game, but on her right. last day of playtesting, she tries to delete the files and fails. Instead of killing Glitch Trap, she undergoes a digital consciousness transfer, just like we do in one of the three bad endings, trapping her in the game and releasing Glitch Trap, presumably into her own body, or just releasing him into the real world. Both of which are possibilities that the yeah. game explicitly... Okay. okay, got it, got it. I got it now. I got it. I understand. I think, I hope, maybe. Okay, so yeah. So, the, I guess the longer you're, you would be in the game, the, the more time he has to take over. And because she waited until the 15th tape to try to delete it, and, you know, like, he's already gotten control at that point. It's too late now. So in the 16th tape, it's not her talking on the log is glitch trap trying to get you know whoever is coming in to play it to release him so he can take control of them next i'm so smart bro i'm so smart warns us about in the opening it's the sequence. most lore i've Fazbear ever talked about entertainment is not responsible for accidental digital consciousness transference real world manifestations of digital characters that my friends is why you always have to read the disclaimer from inside the game she's now stuck with her only hope for escape being to go through the same process she just went through from the other side she creates a new log starting over by saying hello can you hear me? Which in reality is saying, hello, can you hear me in here? Since she's now making the log from yeah. inside the game. She tries to create a new story that encourages a future developer to piece the logs back together and then seeds one final log out there to tease the idea that a future developer can solve the problem by killing off Glitch Trap using her log assembly method. It's smartly constructed because she's counting on future developers having the same curiosity and determination she did. She even mentions this in one of her earlier logs. Tape 3. That when Jeremy had told the developers that something was wrong. But as a dev team, we all just saw it as a challenge to find what the problem was and fix it. We do exactly the same thing. Finding what's wrong and following the instructions on how to fix it. Only to find ourselves on the wrong side of the door covered in handprints. Where presumably lots of other people have been there before us. Glitch Trap or whoever is in the body of Glitch Trap at this point. Perhaps Tape Girl herself disappears into the darkness and takes over our body outside. And now it's our turn to wait oh. for the next beta tester to come in, follow the tapes, and hand over their consciousness to us. Now, so that last move, bit there is spec- So he moves body to body, but what does that do to help him? Like, yes, it gets him out of the game, but 
what does that do? based on the oddities and the audio logs and the fact that following her instructions results in seemingly yet another bad ending. But even if all of that about consciousness switching and her being trapped in the game and us taking her place trapped in the game isn't the case, the point is, William's back. Just not in a way that any of us expected. What seems yeah. undeniable in Help Wanted's story is the fact that his consciousness was preserved in the circuit boards that got scanned to make this game. And now, he's here, as Glitch Trap, tricking players into letting him escape. It's no longer the same guy. He's now an AI replicating the behaviors of William, and snatching the body of whatever completionist is determined enough to play through all the elements of the game. In a funny way, it's exactly like the story we've been piecing together for Petscop. <laughs> odd, actually. Okay. Maybe they really are one and the same, both made by Scott Coffin. The biggest lingering question now in my mind, though, how many Williams are out there? Is this That's just a one great instance question. of an AI looking to escape, and now we're the new host body? Or is it somehow able to replicate itself? copying and pasting its code into any mm. mind out there that's playing its little game. Could Dang. we be entering a new part of the FNAF franchise with multiple William Aftons, all in completely different bodies? For as cool as that would be, and honestly, I think this game could open up that world, I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think that's why there's such an emphasis in this game on you being a beta tester. It's one instance of corrupted code and you happen to be playing it, and now you're infected by it. In the next generation of FNAF, you, or at least your body with William Afton's code oh, in your head is the new killer, and so on and so forth until we finally get to FNAF in space. But hey, that's just that's a theory. theory. A game theory. And we should probably talk about Jeremy. It's weird that his name is used three times. There is oh. no possible way that that's meant to be a coincidence. There's also this random appearance of Shadow Freddy, which I found in my playthrough, which again, seems like an odd little detail that's important to account for mm -hmm. in the Pizza Party minigame. And the fact that Glitch Trap has three toes, just like the footprints that are outside of FNAF 6's house house window. There Ooh. is a lot more here in this game, but I honestly okay. just need more time to think it all through. Rest assured though, I'll be back. I, I always, always come back. back. And that, my friends, is why you should subscribe and ring the bell to make sure that you're notified of all our new uploads, because you can bet I am not done with this new game quite just he yet. Said there it is first. just so much he said to it unpack. First. And again, just as a reminder, we upload new- Okay, I'm gonna stop it right there. Um, my mind is blown. <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed the video uh original links are down in the description and i will see you in the next one peace you win perfect, perfect.